So your first exercise, or the first part that you needed to do, was looking at these four organisms, identify where they go in this food chain. So the very first one, it's for me easier to work bottom to top, starting with flowers. So flowers are a producer, and we know producers are always, always, always at the bottom of the food chain. Now, I know butterflies, just like bees, go flower to flower and get nectar. They don't eat insects or anything like that. So, butterfly is going to go next. Now, remember, that makes it a primary consumer. So, let me actually label these as well. I'm going to put a P next to this one. P just to stand for producer. Next to this butterfly, I'm going to put a 1 degree meaning primary, and I know you mean primary consumer. Now the next one up, we have two left. We have frog and spider. And maybe you're like, well, I don't really know. Like, do frogs eat butterflies? Do spiders eat butterflies? Well, think about frog and spider. I mean, spiders are pretty small, and frogs are much larger. Uh, so at least in that sense, frogs must be eating the spiders. And even if you didn't know spiders eat butterflies, that's okay. But think about frog and spider. So frog must be at the top because it's the largest. That's a really good rule of thumb. Whatever's larger is probably at the top. And then below that we have spider. So if the spider is eating a butterfly, that must make it a secondary consumer because it's an organism that's eating this primary consumer. For the frog, frog must be tertiary because it's eating a secondary consumer. So you're just going one up. So that answers kind of the first question or the first part of the exercise. The first question asks, you know, how many herbivores are there or what are the herbivores? Well in this case we only have one herbivore and that's our butterfly. Our butterfly is eating plants and we know herbivores eat plants. Uh, so we have one herbivore and that herbivore is the butterfly. How many carnivores do we have? Now do not mix up carnivores and consumers. Consumers are just something that eats something else. Carnivores specifically is eating other consumers versus eating producers like herbivores. So in this case we have two carnivores. We have spiders who are eating butterflies. Butterflies are a consumer. We also have frogs. Frogs are eating spiders. So in this case, we have two carnivores. And then in this case, we just have one photosynthesizer, our flowers. Now it asks how many types of consumers we have. Well, in this case, we have three different types of consumers. We have primary consumer, a secondary consumer, and a tertiary consumer. Now it doesn't ask this directly, but if it asked how many producers are there? Producers are photosynthesizers, so that's similar to question three, but just make sure you know both of those terms. Photosynthesizers, plants, producers, all interchangeable. So question five, this is actually something we just went over. If the secondary consumer dies, so if these spiders died, of natural causes. So the frog didn't eat it. Spider just up and day died of old age. Question is, is what happens? What happens next? What happens to that dead body? Well, who eats dead bodies? Decomposers eat dead bodies. So it starts getting decomposed. Now we don't know what's going to start decomposing it, but we know it'll be a decomposer, whether it's a big animal or bacteria, something really, really small. So that bacteria is going to eat. So that bacteria is getting energy from this spider. Well, that bacteria breaks down those compounds in the spider and essentially it poops. Uh, and that mineral, or the minerals or the nutrients coming out of that poop, goes to the soil. And that soil refuels this flower. So I'm going to draw. Um, we're going to say, I'm going to say this is a bacteria, so the B for bacteria. So the spider remains go to this bacteria, the bacteria poop, 
that makes its way, that poop that has nutrients and middle, minerals, make its way into the soil. I'm going to put an S here to represent soil. And these flowers and these producers are going to get those nutrients. They're going to get those minerals as a fertilizer. That's why a lot of people uh, will use like cow poop as a fertilizer, manure as a fertilizer, because it's chock full of nutrients. So that all of that answers question five. Uh, question number six, which of these can be food for decomposers? Uh, this one can be a tricky one. So the answer is all four of these, flowers, butterflies, spiders, frogs, anytime, any single organism, doesn't matter what trophic level it is, any organism, if it dies of natural causes or it dies of not being eaten by something else, decomposers can come in. Vultures don't care if they're eating a deer or if they're eating a cow or if they're eating a wolf. They don't care. It's dead. So decomposers act on any level of the trophic pyramid. The last question just asks, what are three different kind of decomposers we might see in this ecosystem? Uh, one could be bacteria, you could think of mushrooms, think of worms. Vultures, not likely, they usually don't eat small things like frogs. Uh, those are the big three, but just any examples of decomposers could really work here. So hopefully you understood that exercise in your review quiz you're going to see a couple more of questions like this. So I mentioned earlier that between food chains and trophic pyramids, they're kind of the same thing. But trophic pyramids kind of give us a little bit more information that we didn't have before, at least when looking at a food chain. A trophic pyramid, the way it's shaped this way, is it's actually shaped by the number of organisms. So down here, producers are the biggest wedge of this pyramid. It's also the largest. It's at the bottom and it's the largest. Primary consumers, a little bit smaller. Secondary, smaller. Tertiary, smaller. Coronary, smaller. But I don't mean organism size. I mean the actual number of organisms. This is saying if I were to go out into a meadow, there might be a billion blades of grass, but only a million bees, and only a hundred thousand frogs, and only ten thousand snakes, and only one thousand osprey. So the number of organisms is actually decreasing, and think about that. If you see a hawk on the side of the road or flying, that's kind of rare. It's really cool to see that. Or seeing a shark in the ocean, pretty rare event. But seeing other fish, you see those all the time. Seeing trees, you see those everywhere. Seeing insects, you see those everywhere. So think about just your everyday life. What animals do you see all the time? We see squirrels all the time. Squirrels are primary consumers. They're eating acorns, which is part of a plant. We see those everywhere. You might see rats a lot. Uh, you definitely see tons of insects. But when it gets to larger organisms, you really don't see them as often. Why, though? Why don't we have just as many snakes as we do grass? Why don't we have just as many osprey as we do insects? It has to deal with energy. So there is a rule of thumb that only 10% of the energy available or the energy in a trophic level is available to the next one. For instance, if these producers, this uh, let's say a single tree. Let's say there's a hundred calories worth of energy. Calories is a measure of energy. Let's say there's a hundred calories in that tree. Well, that's good. That's good for me. I want to eat those hundred calories. But this rule tells me that even if I ate that entire tree, I would actually only get about 10 calories. That's 10% of that 100. And that's for any level. This frog can eat this caterpillar. This caterpillar could have 50 calories of energy. But in actuality, that frog only gets 5 or only 10% of those calories. Why? One reason, not all the material in an organism is consumed. For instance, this osprey is going to eat a snake. Snakes have bones in them. 
Osprey aren't going to eat those bones. Or thinking about an insect. This caterpillar is eating the leaves. Might eat the stem too, but it's not going to eat the roots. If it's on a tree, it's not going to eat the bark. Well, the bark has calories in it. I just didn't eat it. The bone has calories in it. I just didn't eat it. So that's one way that we're losing energy. Another way we're losing energy is that we eat things, but we don't really digest everything. This is going to be super disgusting, but super true. Corn. Corn kernels. On the outside of corn kernels, there is a layer. It's made of cellulose, which is just a plant material. Humans cannot break down cellulose. So after you eat corn, you should take a look at your poop. Because sometimes you'll see whole corn kernels in it. Because maybe if you didn't chew it all the way, it didn't push out the rest of that corn. It's because our digestive system cannot break down that cellulose of the corn kernel. There's energy in that corn kernel. There's energy in that cellulose skin. Us as humans can't access it. There's a lot of other animals who can, but for us, we lost some of that energy. When you think about poop in general of any organism, they're pooping out things they can't digest. Well, that undigestible stuff has energy in it. So 10% of the energy is at one level, only available at the next. Now, not shown on here is the sun. The sun is giving out lots and lots of energy. Plants are only absorbing about 10% of it. So that 10% rule also deals with plants getting solar energy. The main reason for that disparity is because plants can work but so fast. Uh, they're undergoing photosynthesis, they take in more sun, undergoing photosynthesis, but they, there's more sun than photosynthesis can handle. So the 10% rule works in that direction too. So on page 1-12, uh, uh, there's a quick word problem that we're just going to go through quickly here. Here I have two food chains, and this is looking at the human food chain, uh, a simplified human food chain. Here we have corn and on the left-hand side, and we're saying all humans are vegetarians and we eat corn. On the right-hand side, we're saying here's all the humans, but they're just meat eaters. So here we have this corn, we have this cattle eating this corn, and then we have humans. Let's take a quick second at this. Where do we see more humans? Do we see more humans on the vegetarian side, or do we see more humans on the meat eater side? Hopefully you noticed there's a lot more here on the vegetarian side. Again, think about that energy. We could say there's 100 calories in all of this corn, which means 10 calories available here. Same scenario here, 100 calories of corn, 10 go to the cattle, only one calorie left for humans. Humans in general could be fed so much more if we were all vegetarian, or at least didn't eat as much meat. The amount of corn that we have to feed beef, we could just feed that directly to humans. Because sure, those cows get larger, but they don't get but so much larger. They don't produce but so many more hamburgers because a lot of that energy is lost. So this is a really good rule of thumb to know that humans, as vegetarians, we can support more humans on Earth. Now, I'm not arguing us to all become vegetarians, but just thinking about typical energy transfer, that's kind of the rule of thumb. And... As a follow-up, shorter food chains, so those with less rings, instead of going, you know, primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary, quaternary, sextonary, you know, 10 plus levels, you don't really see that in nature. It's very rare to see five or six levels. The main reason is, is that shorter food chains support more individuals than longer food chains. More people and more individuals can be fed if you're not all the way at the top because if you're all the way at the top barely any energy is getting to you so we're going to stop there stay tuned for the next video